I'm delighted to introduce to you Derek Lomas. He has a Master's in Fine Arts from UCSD, PhD in what? Human Computer Interaction. Computer, okay, <laughs> there's many talents here. Uh, in Human Computer Interaction from Carnegie Mellon. He's now a design fellow at the Design Lab at UCSD, just down the road. Um, he does many things, one of which he's going to talk about today, but I also want you to all know that he also does games for learning. So in the themes that we've heard from last week, uh, if you want to talk to him about that at the reception, please, please be aware. But today he's going to talk about something different. Um, Gary and I heard him talk at the HCI Consortium last June about these large experiments and he thought it was a perfect topic to introduce you to. So that's what he's going to talk about today. Please join me in welcoming Derek. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here to uh, reprise this talk and uh, share a little bit about my research. Uh, a lot of it is about learning games. Um, yeah, I think the mic, I don't think it's on. How's that? Yep. Yeah. Great. So uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about today is uh, really abstracting from the work on learning games uh, around this notion of an interaction design science. One of the things that ties together a lot of my interests is this belief that there will be this field of design eventually as an offshoot of uh, HCI, I hope. Um, but so let, let me get started. So uh, I'm going to describe a little bit about just my, my personal motivations for the uh, research that I'm doing. Uh, and then I'm going to describe uh, the design process for making a particular educational game uh, that I then used for uh, testing various theories of motivation, you know, kind of basic scientific approach, and then also um, for applied research, uh, how we use that same game as a test bed for data-driven interface optimization, uh, and then conclude. So um, what really got me going on this was this intersection between cheap computers the need for global education and uh, the opportunity presented by learning games. Computers are really cheap. Uh, last year, you could get a seven inch dual core tablet for about 25 bucks. And you can see that the tablet sales are, are rapidly uh, displacing PCs, um, in part because they're so cheap and fun. But um, the, the need for global education really uh, was driven home for me when I was doing work with Qualcomm in India. Uh, I was an uh, ethnographic design researcher for them, uh, looking at the adoption of mobile phones as uh, people's first computers. I was looking at the um, adoption of computers by this next billion. And so I spent a lot of time in electronics markets, uh, seeing what sorts of goods were sold. And I kept coming across this really interesting computer that was only $15. Um, and actually, if you bargain, it was only 10. And uh, I was skeptical because most computers don't come with a gun. <laughs> but all of these did. And there were many different brands, but they mostly had the same configuration of uh, this keyboard and game controllers and cartridges and this gun. And so I finally bought one. And it uses a television as a screen. And that's you know, one way that it's so cheap. Um, and it actually comes with one million games. Uh, so, you know, I got to the end there. Um, I didn't play them all. But uh, they include things like Duck Hunt, which explains the gun. Um, and they also had a lot of educational software, which I thought was, was really interesting. So, uh, you know, there were this interface, you'd use a mouse to navigate this interface, and it was all kind of quaint, because it was all 8-bit. Uh, but it had things like typing and music composition. It even had this version of basic programming for making your own video games on this $10 computer. And, you know, thinking back to my own uh, childhood with all these wonderful 8-bit educational games, they were really good. And, uh, and so I you know, just got thinking about, you know, what, what if we could put these really effective games on these really cheap computers. And, and more generally, if you think about, um, if you think about Solitaire, you know, every PC used to come with two games, Solitaire and Minesweeper. And I, I don't know the history of why that was and you know, what they were thinking exactly, but what if you could put something on to all those millions of devices that would impact 
uh, kids in a positive way. What would you choose to put on that? So just as a thought experiment, um, that, that drove us. And so we ended up creating this open source community called playpower.org um, and started making games for this 6502 8-bit uh, computer. Um, and we ended up getting a MacArthur Foundation grant to, to run a series of these uh, learning game design workshops uh, focused on human-centered design. And we, we built a few of these, these different games um, for typing, for scientific literacy, even malaria prevention. Turns out killing a lot of things is a really good game mechanic, and <laughs> no one has a problem with killing mosquitoes. Um, so over the past five years or so, I've developed um, over, over 30 different learning games. And uh, in, in a lot of different domains, mostly in math, a bunch of cognitive skills. If you ever go to SeaWorld, we've got this whole interactive penguin display. Um, but, you know, do any of them work is, is, is a question. And it was the question when I was doing this work at, at Carnegie Mellon. It's a, a, a quantitative place. And, People want to know that, uh, that the work that, that you're doing is having some definite output. And so if you want to prove efficacy, you know, what one thing you could do, you can run a controlled experiment. You, we, we, we could, for instance, take a version of this 8-bit $10 computer and uh, load it up with our games and see whether we get differences if we randomly assign households to get our games or not. And we'll test them on some post-test. but. You know, it's hard to do this, um, and I had just had a, a baby at the time, and I'm like, you know, I'm never going to finish my PhD if I'm doing my research um, distributing these computers in India. So I ended up um, deciding to shift to online games because it seemed like it might be easier to measure some of the outcomes um, that I wanted to study. And <coughs> It's, it's actually, it's really easy to run experiments online. I was saying earlier at lunch, uh, switching from qualitative research to quantitative research because it's just so much easier. Um, so um, probably a lot of you are familiar with some of the A-B testing that companies do. So uh, on a regular basis, they're running tens of thousands of these experiments every day. And usually they're, they're around questions that uh, aren't maybe so interesting from a theoretical perspective, but you know, if you find out that you can increase your real estate sales by 3% with, with this interface than, than this one, well then, fantastic, that's great, and you just used a controlled experiment to figure that out. Um, but there's no theory whatsoever um, in this, and uh, we can run a lot of these different experiments, but it doesn't actually do anything to uh, advance basic science. And so, uh, you know, we can, we can test our different games online, but it's, it's, it's not the most interesting research problem. We, we want to understand the how and the why. We want to be able to add to a, a body of generalizable theory, not just show that one particular artifact is effective <coughs> for learning, uh, at least if we're trying to, you know, participate in, in science. So, Given that there's this massive infrastructure where they're already running so many of these thousands of experiments, you can start to think, well, what if just a small fraction of those experiments were used to test theories that were interesting and rich and would have some generalizable implication? Could this scale of online experimentation actually accelerate our scientific progress? In learning science, the idea is that if we're using all of these different um, you know, pieces of educational software at scale, we could use it to test hypotheses about how different designs affect measurable educational outcomes. And so this is a, a sort of simple model. But when you design things, you use theory, right? So you're making something, and it's based on some set of theory, whether it's formal or implicit. And when you make something, if it's good, you can get it to a very large scale. And at that point, you have these two options for research. You can either do this applied research track where you're, you're trying to just improve these measurable outcomes, or this basic research track where you're trying to improve the theory itself. And so there's this sort of nested feedback loop that I think is, is starting to happen. And so if we think a little bit more generally beyond just the learning sciences about science and design, 
we can more generally look at hypotheses about how designs affect measurable user interactions. And so interaction theory to interaction designs, yada, yada, yada. So um, what we're looking at is generalizable theories about the effects of designs. OK. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a science of design, as in designing, but about designs themselves, about the artifacts, about how the different factors that compose those artifacts have the effects on people. And really what I'm talking about today is a, a, a need for and the emergence of a scientific community that's using these controlled experiments at scale to test theories about how and why designs affect human interactions. And a lot of this happens today already at smaller scales. And, and really, this is about a difference in kind that can happen when you get to very large scale. So um, I'm now going to describe a little bit about how uh, I design games, um, and with a focus on uh, this particular game um, that was focused on fractions. Because there's a, there's a lot of evidence about how bad um, American students are, in particular, with fractions. So rating poor fraction knowledge is one of the, the main barriers to learning algebra. Um, National Mathematics Advisory Panel said it in a nice way. Uh, the most important foundational skill not presently developed. So you can see that in this, this horrible stat from the National Assessment of Education Progress where 50% of eighth graders weren't able to put these fractions into the right order. They're not particularly crazy fractions either. Um, but this suggests that students don't have a, a strong number sense for what those fractions are. They're probably trying to find the you know, lowest common denominator or something in order to, to order them. They, they didn't have a good way of uh, approximating uh, their, their size or, the, or their magnitude. And so in approaching uh, the, the design of, of our games, we, we use this backwards design process. It's a, it's a simple pattern. Um, you know, you start with your goals, you then figure out how you'd measure whether your goals are reached, and then you develop a design. And then this last piece is, is really the most important, because what we're saying is that you want to teach to the test. You want to come up with a test, and then you want to teach to the test. But the reason why it's generally bad to teach for the test is that it ends up being a bad test. If you can just memorize the order of something, and uh, you know all the items that are on there, it ends up not being a good test. So that's where this continuous alignment comes in. You need to make sure that what your assessment actually is, is aligned with the design, so that when you make changes, you can measure them. And it's, it's, a, it's a really simple pattern, but uh, I found it to be very useful. So this is an example of how we eventually get to some sort of alignment. We want to improve fraction number sense. We'd measure this by estimating fractions on a number line or through these magnitude comparisons. And so for instruction, it seems pretty straightforward. We want to give students a lot of practice estimating fractions on a number line. And because we want it to be enjoyable, we'd measure that with a, you know, some intrinsic motivation inventory. And so uh, we'd, we'd want to do something that students find intrinsically motivating, so we come up with these uh, game-like context for, for doing it. Uh, this is an example of some of the assessments that we used. And this is the game that we came up with. Really simple game. You're either typing in a fraction to try to blow up the ship, uh, or you're given a fraction and you need to click on where you think this hidden submarine is. And so you can just kind of keep doing this for a while. Um, and so there are these, these two different modes, again, where you're either typing in a fraction or you're clicking. And uh, what was key at the beginning is to first show that we're able to measure our key outcomes. And, and the key outcomes that we had were we wanted to know students' ability. We wanted to be able to use the game as a measure of a, a student's ability. We wanted to track learning over time. And we wanted to understand some other things about the game itself. So 
challenge and motivation. How challenging was the game and how motivating was it? And so in a classroom study, uh, we, first, um, we first had students play a randomly ordered set of, uh, of different fraction items in this game so that we were able to show their improvement uh, over these different opportunities. And you can see how the, uh, how the performance, the accuracy of their estimates, as well as the number of ships they were able to hit uh, rose consistently with uh, their experience. <laughs> And challenge, we were able to measure in, in two different ways, uh, either with the reaction time, which is sort of you're thinking through these harder problems. So one half, it's very, people don't think very long to find one half. It's pretty easy. Uh, they're also very uh, successful at it. So this is the failure rate. So one half has a very low failure rate. On the other hand, uh, three-fifths or, or three-sevenths these have a relatively high failure rate. They're, they're, they're hard. Uh, people also think for a longer amount of time before they answer. So we have these two different converging measures about uh, challenge or difficulty. And then for being able to use the game to measure uh, ability, we look at the psychometric properties of the game itself. So uh, we want to find out about its internal consistency, how well the different items can reliably be measuring the same construct of a student's number sense, and how well the game correlates with a, a, a paper and pencil test. And so we, we found that the, the game was a, uh, a pretty decent uh, instrument for measuring students' number sense. Uh, then finally, for, for being able to measure motivation, this has been done uh, by a variety of different groups. So you, you randomly assign students online to two different versions, and whichever version of the game people play for longer, they were more motivated to play. So if one version people are dropping out sooner, uh, that's less motivating. Maybe it's less fun, maybe they were less interested in it, we don't exactly know. But we do know that they were less motivated. And so here we get this, this other uh, really nice measure of uh, a student's, of the game's ability to intrinsically motivate the students. So by establishing that we're able to measure challenge, ability, uh, learning, um, we can then look at these basic research questions to test different theories about how challenge, ability, learning, and motivation relate to one another. Uh, and we can use online applied research to just improve those outcomes, to improve the learning outcomes. We were able to achieve scale because we, uh, we won this national STEM game competition. And we partnered with BrainPop, where we were then deployed in almost 10% of all schools in America. Um, and students can choose a, a number of different games, but we get between uh, two to 10,000 game plays per day, depending on how they feature us. And on average, it's about three minutes or 22 estimates each. Um, and we've had about three million games played uh, since the launch. And so there's, there's plenty for being able to do the kind of online research uh, that we want to do. And so the basic research questions really centered on you know, what we were able to measure, um, the relationship between challenge, motivation, and learning. So there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of theory about human motivation. And in fact, there's so much theory that there's a lot of different taxonomies to organize that theory. Uh, one of my favorites is from uh, Tom Malone and Mark Lepper, their uh, taxonomy of intrinsic motivations for learning. But there's a, there's a whole bunch of other taxonomies describing how different design elements um, affect human motivation. And so looking at just this, this first one, there were, there were these six Major, um, major areas and about 25 different heuristics for how you design um, to, to support uh, motivation. And so the very first one in their taxonomy was that the, the activity should provide a continuously optimal intermediate level of difficulty for the learner. So it's a, a nice heuristic. It shouldn't be too hard. It shouldn't be too easy. It should be somewhere in the middle. Um, and specifically, maybe around 50%. Because that's where you have the optimal uncertainty. Um, you don't know whether you're going to be right or wrong. 
and uh, some other researchers had found that, uh, Atkinson had found that 50% uh, uh, was this, this sort of optimum. Um, and so you know, other researchers had, have looked at this. Uh, Mihai Chicks and Mihai's theory of flow is, is very similar. The expectation is that you don't want things to be too hard or too easy. This is one of the, the, the central theories in, uh, in game design. Um, that if things are too easy, you get bored. If they're too hard, you get anxious. But if it's right in the middle, that's where you should have your maximum enjoyment. And so for us, we'd expect that as we increase challenge, we'd get this nice inverted U shape. So this is, let's say, the, the amount of time that students are playing the game. And as we increase the challenge of the game, there'd be some place where they're playing for the most amount of time. So Mihai Chiksen Mihai um, and one of uh, his collaborators, they collected data from over a thousand different chess games. And they looked at, they measured difficulty as the difference in the ranking of the chess players. So if you play someone with a really high ranking and you're low, that's going to be a really tough game. If you play someone, you've got the same ranking, you don't know who's going to win. That's how they set up the rankings. And their measure of enjoyment was they'd, they'd ask you after, after you played the game. And they found, this is a, a, a slight inverted view, but the, the maximum is, is around here. And 20% uh, probability of success being the most enjoyable. So here's actually where it's extremely difficult. And here's where it's extremely easy. And so they're getting this maximum right up here. So, uh, we sought to test the same hypothesis, that uh, a moderate level of challenge would produce maximum motivation. And so what we needed to do is create a bunch of different versions of the game that would affect the difficulty. And then we'd randomly assign players to these different versions, and then we'd simply plot the effects of challenge on their motivation, uh, as in how long they play. So some of the different factors that can affect uh, the difficulty of the game. If we make this target for estimating really big, you're going to be more likely to hit it. So if, if you have to estimate where this is on the line, if we make it a very small ship, it'll, you have to be very precise to be able to hit it. If you make it a big ship, uh, it'll be a lot easier. We have this time limit where you have to answer within a certain amount of time or it's incorrect. And then some items are easier than others. For instance, I showed the three-fifths and three-sevenths. Those are pretty tough. So we can organize the items uh, to change the difficulty. So then what we did is we created this really big experiment. It was a two by nine by eight by six by four by four factorial um, with 14,000 variations. And we randomly assigned them to about 70,000 game players. And uh, we also had this pretest. So it was a, just a four-item in-game assessment to measure students' ability. And we had previously validated this, um, that it worked pretty well. And so the, the data ends up looking something like this. So um, this is the, the ship mode where you're typing. This is the submarine where you're clicking. This is the high pretest players and the low pretest players. And this is the success rate. So a high success rate, uh, it's you know, it's, it's easier or harder. Uh, so if you've got a, a high pretest, everything's going to be a little bit easier for you. Um, as the time limit increases, people plateau in their performance. As the target size increases, they uh, continuously improve. It just gets easier and easier the bigger that ship gets. And then with item sets, we had a lot of uh, variation here. Up at the top, this is the duration of play. We, we mixed together the amount of time that people were playing as well as the number of items that they tried to explode. Um, and so here you see some of the relationships. I won't go into the, the details there, but you can see that some of them are lining up and they're correlating, and some of them don't seem to really have anything to do with each other. What we then did is we took all those different factors of difficulty and we extracted out this, this one difficulty factor, uh, where we just, we just created a, a model of, of how those different factors affected difficulty. And we labeled the, the different versions. And then we laid them all out here. And 
we saw that the, the easier it got, so this is the, uh, the failure rate. Okay, so this is 80% um, failure rate, this is a 10% failure rate. So even once it got really easy, we're still not getting this curve. And this was, this was really surprising for us. Um, and so, you know, we looked at the data a lot because I thought I was doing something wrong. Um, and there was one exception. Everything that made the game harder also made it less motivating, except for novelty. So um, this is an example where uh, this was the easiest set of items, but they were really repetitive. There was, there was a small set of really easy items, but they, even though it was easier, it was much less motivating than a more diverse set of items that was more difficult, but, but more diverse. And so there's this idea that novelty may be a separable motivational design factor uh, different from, from difficulty. Um, and so as a, as a mechanism, Donald had described this, uh, this inverted U-shape. He, he sort of caused this, this problem in a certain way because people have found inverted U-shapes all over the place. Um, you know, everything from coffee to stress uh, cause this inverted U-shape in performance. And his idea is that many different factors can contribute to an optimal level of arousal. If you're almost falling asleep, you're not going to perform very well. Or if you're just absolutely shocked by the amount of activity, you're not going to perform very well. Somewhere in the middle, there's an optimal level of arousal. So the idea is, is that it might be challenge, it might be novelty, but these are things that could be contributing to your overall arousal, and that might be creating this inverted U-shape. So we sought to test that hypothesis, that novelty would generate a uh, inverted U. Um, and we're measuring novelty in terms of task variability. So what we did is we, um, we had the game change every few items. So it would either change its design every one item, every two items, every four items, every 10 items. And so this is the sort of length of the level uh, for how long you would play before the game would change. And sure enough, we got this really <coughs> nice inverted U shape, where yeah, if it's changing every time, um, that's not very fun. You drop out a lot sooner. If it never changes at all, um, it's less interesting than if it's changing every once in a while. So this was, this was a, a pretty strong finding. And so one of the things that this implied is that maybe we've been emphasizing the wrong factor. Maybe difficulty, it's not so important to have this optimal level of difficulty. Maybe we've really been overrating difficulty. Maybe it's more about the novelty aspects that give challenge its, its satisfying nature. Because we all know you know, whether it's, in, in anything that we do, it's fun to do things that are challenging. But it might not because w when we do something challenging, we're more likely to fail, but because when we do something challenging, there's, there's something new there. There's new things for us to experience. And so novelty may be the factor that is more important in um, our gaming experiences or, or learning experiences. And the negative feedback that we get from difficulty um, might just be overrated. Another uh, hypothesis that we were looking at is whether conditions with more learning are more motivating. So this has come up in various times that you know, learning is the thing that makes games fun. And unfortunately, what we found is that uh, so these small targets, they were much less motivating but students' learning curves were, were much faster. So this is their error rate. And they're, they're reducing their error much faster with these harder, um, these harder designs than with these easier designs. And so this suggests that it's not so simple that just learning is what's fun. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different <coughs> reasons for why we didn't find that inverted U-shape uh, in challenge. And one of the big things that was different between our study and the chess study is that the chess study didn't have random assignment, and you knew how hard your opponent was. So when people were, were choosing to play someone that was 
uh, higher ranked than them, people would be able to improve their own ranking. So if you beat someone with a higher ranking, that improves your own ranking. And you also might feel better about yourself. If you get crushed by someone with a really high ranking, that might feel better than if you just get crushed and you didn't know that they were so highly ranked. So we thought that if we created conditions where players could knowingly choose uh, their difficulty, we might see a similar <coughs> inverted U. So what we did is we, we randomly assigned players to either be able to choose uh, various levels of difficulty, so this is very easy to very hard, or they could just choose these sort of random pirate-related icons as their game, so no relationship to, to difficulty or even a list. Or they were told, this is making a very hard level for you, so we can tell them the difficulty they're getting. Or they don't get a choice and they don't get any feed forward. They don't, they don't, they're not told how difficult it's going to be. So uh, the first hypothesis was that players would prefer to play moderately difficult levels. This shows the choices that players were making when it was easy to hard. And it doesn't look like it inverted you at all. It's almost the opposite. So there was actually a lot of interest in playing the very hard level. Um, most of the play was on the, the easier side. So we couldn't really confirm that hypothesis. Uh, then we figured that higher ability players would be more interested in playing harder levels. And that we did confirm. So here's the player's pretest score. So up here, these are the higher ability players. This is the success rate of the level, so these are harder, level, uh, harder levels and easier levels. So as the, the levels get harder, um, as the player's ability improves, they're choosing harder levels. So that, that one we could confirm pretty, pretty easily. Uh, then players who chose a moderate level of difficulty will be most motivated. So I have to break that one apart because we, we found this really clearly, that when players chose a moderate level of difficulty, like a, a medium, they would play for longer than anybody else. But the problem is, is that we didn't randomly assign them to this. This, was a, this. this could very easily have been a population effect where the most motivated players are those who are choosing moderate difficulty. So it's not that the moderate level of difficulty is making them motivated. It's that people who are really motivated are seeking out more challenge. Um, so then we went back to the chess study. And another thing that was really interesting that they found was that when games were close, so this is the relative performance of the game along here. Um, zero, I guess, would be a draw. But as the numbers increase, this is the point value of, of the chess pieces. So when you have a very close game, people enjoy it a lot. And that, that seemed pretty strong. So we thought, well, if we can set up a, a winning and losing situation, then players might be most motivated when they have this close game. So ideally, what we would have done is randomly assign people to have close games, but we can't quite do that. So instead, what we did is we assign them to have different goal criteria. So either to win, you had to get over 40% um, of all the items correct, uh, up to 100% success. And uh, by changing this criteria, we could factor out players' actual performance and look at the closeness of their game as a separate factor. And so that let us show that, yes, when you, when you have a close loss, it's almost as good as winning the game. And when you have a blowout win, it's not nearly as fun as when you have a close win. And that's sort of shown here as well. So these are the close games. And this is winning and losing. And you can see that having a close loss is almost as good as having uh, a, a blowout win. So there was a bunch of different hypotheses. And that's sort of the point, is that with these online experiments, you can test a lot of different things. And these are all theoretically motivated. These aren't sort of random hypotheses that we're testing. These are coming out from the literature. They're embedded in a, a body of, of scientific theory. And we could go through and say, 
Uh, no, the relationship between challenge and motivation is not this inverted U, at least not in our situation. Uh, fun does not appear to be uh, synonymous with learning. Novelty pr produces this really nice inverted U shape. Um, people do not prefer moderately challenging levels, so they're not choosing medium difficulty more than they are uh, easy or hard, or uh, if you remember that graph. So we could go through and, and just test a lot of these different <coughs> hypotheses. And so what this suggests is that we could take something as large as that um, taxonomy of intrinsic motivation uh, for learning and just test the whole thing. You know, there's 25 different um, heuristics that are involved there and we could go through and we could uh, fill out that, that taxonomy and really make um, a strong, em 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 empirically derived body of, of theory that, that would support uh, improved game design. And so one thing that, that I find interesting in this space is that the only questions we're able to investigate at a theoretical level are those we can measure, right? If we couldn't measure novelty, if we didn't have a way of measuring which game condition was more novel than another, we couldn't be speaking to it theoretically. We couldn't measure motivation or, or difficulty. We, we, we couldn't uh, make any claims about it theoretically. But once we have those measures, anybody who's experimenting with those measures is potentially contributing to this, this is what Kronbach called a, a nomological network. Uh, so the idea is, is that there's a difference between the theoretical construct and how we're measuring it, but there is this, this these relationships between these constructs that we can build up over time. And so this is the, this is the sort of vision for um, how many hundreds or thousands of experiments would be contributing to the same space of theory in understanding how these and other theoretical constructs would be interacting with each other. So I'm not going to move on to the more applied research side. Uh, so less theoretical but more looking at how we just optimize our outcomes when we're able to run a lot of experiments. So I became overwhelmed when, when I was running all these different experiments. It was so clear that uh, there was way more that I could test and ask than I could actually analyze, um, set up experiments for, uh, write papers for. And so I started thinking a lot about how machine learning techniques uh, and AI techniques could help us automatically explore the design space and optimize for it. And so I like to think about how scientists of the future might be able to cope uh, with this uh, ability to run thousands of theoretical experiments every year. So they've got to generate the hypotheses, they've got to design the experiments, they've got to synthesize the research results, and then there's the papers. It's a lot of papers. So uh, this notion of how AI might support scientific inquiry, and specifically scientific theory development, I think is, is really important. Because you know, what theory does is, is it helps us break down the world into a smaller set of components so that we can understand it. It helps us generalize. And it helps us make good decisions. Um, I think of it in terms of reducing the dimensionality of the design space. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So a, a design space is, is you know, pretty simply the multiplication of design factors. So anything that you're varying in, in producing a design or anything that's variable, the, the colors, the size, you know, the, the way it's delivered, all of these different things um, are different factors in your design space. We have 14 different design factors in what we instantiated in this particular game. And multiplied together, that's 3.6 billion different variations. Somewhere in there uh, is the most motivating one. And somewhere in there is the most learningful one. And somewhere in there is the, the, the optimum of, of both. Uh, but this shows we can't just test them all. It's, it's too big. Um, and so one of the things that theories do is they help us reduce the design space into more meaningful components. So if we're thinking about the surface level of the design space, where it's all of the different factors themselves of the size and the type and the time limit, all those things, 
it, it's really not that complicated because it gets reduced down. Most of the ways that they affect the experience is through how they function to change the difficulty uh, or the perceived challenge uh, of the game. And so what I'm trying to say is that when you have theory, you can take this great big design space and reduce it down into something that's more tractable to study. So here's this model again. Um, our goal would be to build theories about designs that explain their effects. And so thinking about how we might be able to use uh, AI in this, we first need to be able to efficiently explore the design space. We need to be able to take advantage of large numbers of users that we're not currently using. So every, every day that I wasn't running an experiment felt like a bit of a waste. And probably used about two weeks worth in the year of the total amount of experiments that I could have been running for what, for what I showed today. And so there's all this throughput that we could be taking advantage of, but we're not because it's just too hard to set it all up. But then we don't want to expose people to bad experimental designs. I mean, we don't just want to throw spaghetti at all these kids that are playing the games. We, 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 if something's not working well, we want to take it out as quickly as possible. So as a research question, we, we want to think about how to automate our experimentation so that we can systematically test that big design space while minimizing exposure to users. So there's this really great set of research in machine learning um, around what's known as the multi-arm bandit problem. Uh, like much of statistics, it was developed out of a way to gamble better. And, um, the idea is that if you've got a pot of money and you want to maximize it and you've got a, a row of slot machines and you know that some of them are paying out better than others, you need to be able to balance your exploration with your exploitation. So if you think that one is paying out, you might want to put more money in that one. But at the same time, you still need to explore these other slot machines because they might have not paid out before just due to chance. And it's a, it's a really hard problem that's more or less been, been solved, theoretically. Um, and so what I, what I try to do is, is look at how to apply this for interaction design space optimization. And so a way to think about how this works is with error bars. So let's say you've got these three different design options, and you've got this measure of motivation. This one is the highest mean motivation. This one's got the lowest. The way that the bandits would work is they always choose the one with the highest error bar. Because it either means you don't have enough information, as in this case, where you've got this really long error bar because you know, maybe you didn't collect enough samples, uh, or uh, it might just have a high mean. So this is, this is one way that, uh, to, to think about how bandits balance between collecting more information uh, and, and exploiting uh, the information that it, are, that it already has. It's just choosing the one with the highest error bars. So um, you know, the first hypothesis is that a, a banded algorithm can automatically search through the design space to find the best design. And the second is that uh, this banded algorithm can reduce the cost of experimentation to players. It'll expose them to fewer bad conditions. And so what we did is we ran a meta experiment. We, it was an experiment of experimental approaches. So we either randomly assigned players, we gave them this, um, this one version of the bandit, uh, or this other version of the bandit. We were looking to see how they'd all uh, compare to each other. And so this shows the engagement of these six different conditions that were in, uh, in, in the experiment as a whole. And so you, you can see that this sub-90 is the most motivating. And these are the total number of games assigned. So in the random condition, it's random, all relatively equally assigned. And then in these two bandit conditions, they assigned the most motivating one the most. And so we could confirm that they were able to find the, the most motivating design. 
And secondly, that they uh, reduce the cost of experimentation of players. So this is the sum of all the players' engagement. And you can see that players overall played more when they were in this experiment. So this, this shows that, that the bandits were taking out the bad conditions um, and exposing students to the good conditions. And this, this has some implications for uh, the ethics of how we expand experimentation, particularly in an educational space. Because people don't like being guinea pigs, but they like to have the, the new and the best thing available. And so if we have some way that allows us to optimize, um, it, it's a challenging thing as to whether we should be experimenting at all, because someone's always going to be in the bad condition. But as soon as you know that, you're able to promote the better conditions. So what this doesn't do yet, that's, that's room for future work, is um, actually contribute to something that's generalizing. So this is only looking at uh, each individual condition as, as its own unique arm of a, of a slot machine. It's, it's not able to learn, um, it's not able to share information between the different arms, and it's not able to create anything close to a general model uh, that, that would support theory development. But this, this way of how we produce uh, an integration of, of, of AI and scientists to generate theory is, is what I think is really promising for future work. And there's a ton of theory to explore, like I've said. So um, I've described how, um, how our experiments online at scale uh, have challenged some existing dominant theories of motivation uh, and shown how AI-assisted um, how, how AI is able to assist our, our exploration and optimization of, of game design, uh, and, and also shown this, this model for how basic research could piggyback on large-scale applied experimentation in, in industry. And that's, that's what I think is really this, this very big opportunity, that if, if companies are running all these thousands of experiments, how, how could we get a little piece of that? But there's a lot of limitations to this work as well. It's just with, with one game. Um, there's a lot more measures that we want to validate uh, in offline uh, laboratory studies. And it's, it's just frankly unclear how far this will generalize. Um, but you know, that's, that's the drum I'm banging, is that if we can build up this community of practice around online experimentation, um, there's, there's a lot of really great stuff that we can do. Uh, for building this shared theoretical space of how designs affect human motivation, learning, uh, and other, other constructs. So um, big picture, trying to show how we can use large-scale experiments to contribute to both basic and applied research. And this is, this is just something that I think about in terms of the, the evolution of theory. So, People create theories all the time in their their day to day life to try to explain why things are. Um, you know, outside of any anything scientific, we we use our abstract reasoning to to, to understand the world, and and science is able to uh, develop these more formal theories um, that we're all familiar with. But my feeling is is that there's something there's something new that's 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 coming soon um, uh, that that reflects the way that um, that algorithms are able to find generalizations uh, in collaboration with people. And I'm not quite sure exactly what's here, but uh, it, it, feels, it feels very important and it, and it feels something um, that's uh, available for investigation today because of our ability to run experiments at scale. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm hoping to contribute to, to, to learning science. I'm, I'm hoping that there is this design science that can become stronger uh, and more widespread to support this field of design. And I really hope that, th that there'll be ways of just accelerating the way that technology contributes to, to learning uh, at scale. Uh, this, is, this is how uh, I've, I've organized a lot of my other work, is, is looking at how we're able to design uh, digital experiences that can globally scale. So um, I'll, I'll look forward to taking any, any questions now. Um, and just thank you very much for, for having me come present the work. Do you have time for some questions? Um, you're
strategy probably me a little bit that when you were looking at these different uh, principles from motivation theory, you took one principle and did one test, took another principle and did one test, took another principle and did one test, and you at the end qualified by saying, well, it was one game. I'm surprised you didn't try to take one of the principles and do more of an in-depth thing where you had six games or you know some way to vary the, si the situation. You you talked about in you know, my situation this happened. Yes. Well, it's, you know, there's a lot of a lot of evidence that situations matter a lot. So I'm surprised you didn't take one at least one of these principles and dig into that one more. So this um, let's see if there's a way to. Could you summarize the question? Yeah, sure. So the question is, um, uh, basically, uh, I mentioned it's a limitation that I was only investigating this with one game, but why didn't I take it further and look at a lot of different games to see whether this generalizes? At least for one principle. At least for one principle. So um, if I'm able to, I guess I need to mirror my screen. Um, well, this I can just do by showing it this way so that we've got the time. So we've, we've recently put together um, all the different games that we've designed and um, created an API that will allow us to do just that. And so now um, what we're doing is we're putting this together. It kind of looks like Candy Crush a little bit. You're just unlocking these different levels and uh, we're able to randomly assign players to the different games as you go through. And this, uh, this, this infrastructure, and I can just kind of keep going, this, we've made a lot of different games. And so this infrastructure that we've now built, I think will be really well prepared to generalize our findings. Um, and perhaps, you know, it'll be great if we find, oh, well, in this situation, we did find the inverted U. It was really clear. And in these situations, we didn't. Because that will then um, provoke us to figure out what was it about the designs that, that actually changed things. I was just curious if there's other uh, theoretical constructs aside from what you're looking at with um, acceptance size work that you're trying to apply to this learning theory, just because it seems like there would be these obvious differences for students who are like fearful of math, trying to learn math, and in their like how challenge plays into that than chess. So I'm not sure that it, you're ever gonna necessarily find the U shape. So I'm just wondering, um, you were mentioning theory is important. Like what other theory theory constructs are you looking at? Yeah. So some of the other things that would be involved is um, you know your uh, level of expertise. So we can assume that all these chess players have played the game a lot of times, and we can assume that with the, the online Battleship Neverland players, they, they haven't. Um, so I'd say that, that that would be one. Um, another could be the context. So we've looked at um, factoring out time of day um, and the, the effect on you know, this, resi this persistence through challenge. We've also looked at uh, geographically whether, you know, hey, maybe kids in Asia are more <laughs> likely to uh, pursue challenge. Uh, so we've looked at a few of those things. Um, but, but those are examples of some of the other theoretical constructs that, that would be important in, uh, in theory. Uh, um, one, it seems to me that one of the, the main differences between the, 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 the way you designed your study and the chess example is that in chess, uh, it's not a player versus a game, it's a player versus another player. So competition, um, which brings in the messy social back into the situation and um, the question of learning as being more than an interface between uh, a game and a learner. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I mean, there's probably ways of uh, Turning, this in, turning the social into variables and then factoring them out, um, which would be useful for uh, pursuing certain hypotheses, but it also makes it less useful in actual situations. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you deal with, um, or is there a way, so it seems to me this is, this is enlarging your design space beyond the 3.6 billion possible <laughs> factors. Yeah, sure. And it's, and it's enlarging it hugely. Um, so how do you how how do we even start to address questions about uh, the learning situation? Uh, so to summarize the question, um, you know, you're saying that one of the biggest differences between chess and Battleship Numberline is the competition factor, um, and how do we start incorporating in these? 
these different factors that we did, would expect to have an effect, um, you know, even though it's going to blow up our design space. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the one of the important things is the. Um, on one hand, we miss out on some of the some the the rich complexity of, of social interactions, um, the sort of status effects of social interactions, uh, you know, doing things because you have greater status. We were able to kind of factor all those out. But now, I think we just want to factor them back in. Um, you know, whether it's taking this game and layering in a sort of uh, two-player component um, or testing chess uh, against a computer versus other people, um, with different difficulty levels. So I, I think that there's, there's ways of making those manipulations that fit into this, this research paradigm uh, that are relatively straightforward and would be pretty fun to do. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe their findings with chess hold up perfectly when you're playing against a computer. Maybe they don't at all. Um, but it could definitely be investigated pretty, in a pretty straightforward way. Uh -huh. Thanks. This is really interesting work. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the kinds of theories you're talking about and the, the goals, I guess, that, the, of the experimentation. Because you're really talking about population level theories. Mm -hmm. This is about this fictional average user will have this experience with this game. And about optimizing the game for that fictional average user. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about if you could just speak to the possibilities for using this in a space that actually says maybe something like fit with a learning style or kind of a more personalized sure. approach yeah. is that rather than optimizing the game, optimizing the learner game match. Sure. So an initial attempt for this was our little embedded pretest. Because yeah. you know, in the way we were setting this up, we were sure we were going to find this inverted U shape. And I was all interested to say, oh, it's 82% is the optimal level of failure in a game. Um, and we thought that it would be a different optimal level for those with higher abilities and lower abilities. And in that case, we could then personalize, oh, based on your ability, then we'll give you this level. And so yada, yada, yada. That didn't happen, but um, if it had happened, there's then no reason why we couldn't dive in even deeper and say, um, you know, for those, you know, people with this uh, personal factor, this set of design factors is going to work better for you. Um, so I, I think that, it, in fact, it's probably one of the only ways that we'd be able to get to, because once you start adding these individual factors, it's not the design space, it's just the, the, the problem space, and then it gets really big. Um, so are you an English uh, language learner? Are you, uh, you know, what's your math ability? Um, you know, what's your gaming experience? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those become additional factors that we need to search through uh, for interactions with the design. Um, and it seems like there's some hope to do that with this kind of scale, um, but, but that's, that's how I'd be thinking about it. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, this method depends on the students getting access to your game. Mm -hmm. And you had this miracle happen that you were a contest winner yeah. and it got out there. So if somebody wants to join your parade, how do they get access to the kids? So now, I think I know how to do it in a more consistent way. And that's one of my goals with this, uh, this next project, this uh, Candy Crush knockoff uh, for the Brain Games, is that um, we're going to be going around to, to different groups like Brain Pop and I don't know if anyone's ever heard of coolmathgames.com. Um, it's got to be the most poorly designed website that I've ever seen. And it is unbelievably popular uh, among students, parents, and teachers. And there's just they just aggregate together a lot of different games that are appropriate for kids. So my feeling is, is that it's actually not that hard to get to scale so long as, I mean, you saw our production values. This is, these are not terribly high production values. Uh, but they're good enough that you can play. And people do enjoy playing the game. And so once you have something that's at this reasonable level of production, I think there's a lot of people that um, would be open to, to making it available. Any other questions?
Okay, let's thank him again. Thank you so much.